so this happened to me in 2009. I was 22 at the time, but I'm very short and often mistaken for a young teen. I had just had a driving lesson, and while normally my instructor would drop me off in front of my house at the end of our lessons, that day he had somewhere to be straight after and dropped me off at a nearby bus stop. My apartment block was about 500 meters away at the end of a long stretch of quiet road. It was an area that was being built up at the time, so there were a couple of abandoned old houses to the left and the right, and my apartment block at the very end, and that's it. It was rare to see cars there that weren't just going straight to the apartment block, because there was just nothing there, except for a clinic a couple of streets away, so you could occasionally get someone who's lost, looking for directions. So it's around 8pm and it just got dark outside. The street is barely lit, but it only takes a few minutes to get from the bus stop to my house, so I don't think anything of it, until a car drives past me, but then starts backing up until it's driving slowly beside me. A woman is driving, and a man is in the passenger seat. I sort of slow down, thinking they're going to ask me for directions to the clinic. The woman asks, Do you live here? So now I'm thinking, they definitely want directions, and I stop and say, yes. But then she says, we are the police, and we're going to take you home. Mind you, this is a totally normal vehicle. These people aren't in uniform, or look in any way official. I'm incredulous, literally so stunned. All I can say is something like, you're taking the piss, not an English-speaking country. Immediately, I'm thinking these people think I'm like 10 and they're trying to kidnap me. The woman is starting to get agitated and keeps repeating, You have to respect the police. Get in the car and we will take you home. I am so shocked. I'm like, how dare you? Partly offended that someone would think people are stupid enough to fall for this. At this point, the car is stopped and I see the woman moving to open the door so I burst into the fastest sprint of my life while fumbling with my phone to call my mom, screaming before I'd even got to the block. Buzz me in, I'm in danger. My dad went out to look for them immediately after, but the car was nowhere in the area. He informed the police, but nothing ever came of it. I've always been super creeped out by this story and often find myself wondering what their intentions were. Glad the story has now found its home. I was 11 at the time and living in a nice suburban area. We had recently moved into this house that my parents had built and it was our first home versus rented house in a sketchy area. It was a very nice neighborhood. The whole family made friends quickly with lots of neighbors but especially the ones three doors down. They had a daughter my age, I'm male by the way, and a daughter five years younger, which was the same age as my sister. Our parents got along well, and we began hanging out quite a bit for barbecues at their house, or parties at our house, etc. Friendships were formed quickly and seemed to be very strong. After a year or so, I started realizing things weren't what they seemed. I remember seeing police cars at their house a few times in the evenings, and when I'd ask my parents what was going on, it was always nothing, just checking in on them type answers. I was no genius, but at 11, that didn't add up. Why didn't the cops just check up on us? One day I'm at their house, playing and hanging out, and the daughter goes across the street to get another mutual friend, which left myself and the father alone in the house. This was really no big deal, as it had happened before, but then he approached me and just seemed off. I still don't know what made me feel this way, but I was very uncomfortable and started thinking about leaving. About five minutes later, he tells me he has something cool to show me. I don't remember what it was, but I think it was something about baseball cards, which I was very fond of. I excitedly started following him, he pulled the attic ladder down and asked me to follow him, which I did without hesitation at first. Then something happened, and I still can't process what it was. He was ahead of me on the ladder, 
and when he looked back to help me into the attic, there was something off, something about his eyes, his face, his grin. It wasn't right. It looked evil. I can still see it clear as day and can't recognize exactly what it was that set my alarms off. Whatever it was, was plenty, because I jumped off the ladder and ran out the door. I sprinted all the way home and was choking back tears when I busted through my front door. Mom was there when I came through and could see I was obviously out of sorts and immediately started calming me down. As I came to my senses, I explained what happened. My mom was concerned with how scared I was, but mostly brushed it off to me being scared, young, silly, etc. Shit you not, that same exact night, I was woken up around 3am. It was my mom sitting on my bed, and as I awoke, she held me like a baby. I remember how she smelled, and how tightly she held me, and I remember her tears hitting my cheek. Eventually, I saw out the window to the neighbor's house, surrounded by police and fire trucks, etc. The neighbor dad had unalived himself and his daughter in the attic after a standoff with the police. There isn't a doubt in my mind, nor in my mother's, that would have been me had I made it into the attic. I still get chills thinking about it. So neighbor man, let's not meet, even in the afterlife. Several years ago, I walked a handful of blocks up the street from my partner's house to a convenience store to buy something to drink. It was about 11pm and I was trying to slide in there before the store closed. To set the scene, we lived in a transitory neighborhood that was chock full of abandoned houses and crime, with a few occupied residents and businesses scattered about. There were zero streetlights or illumination. Envision a more compact version of the type of Detroit neighborhood exemplified in the movie Barbarian, and you won't be far off the mark. Looking back, the nighttime excursions to the store, or from my place to his, were absolutely idiotic on my part. But after living in that environment for years, you just become accustomed to it. Anyway, it was one of my many foolhardy nighttime store trips. My partner, by then, would ask me not to do it but I just ignored that. I wanted my drink, so dumb of me. I got the few blocks up the street in the usual darkness, got my drink, and left the store to head back. Outside the store, a guy was standing near the trash can, hassling everyone who came out, asking for money, cigarettes, etc. I told him I didn't have anything and started across the parking lot and head back, but this guy sprang after me like a freaking rabbit and grabbed a hold of my arm. He starts aggressively demanding that I go to a party with him and trying to steer me down the pitch black side street just beside the convenience store. He was probably six foot seven, crazy tall and super thin, with dreads all in his face, making it hard to even see what he looked like. His fingers bit into my arm and felt like they pinched a nerve. My heart starts pounding like crazy right away. I was used to brushing off this type of behavior, having lived in that neighborhood for several years by then, but this was way more aggressive than anything I'd faced so far. I shook my arm out of his grasp, told him I was heading to my boyfriend's place, and it was only a few blocks down the street. He was waiting for me, said sorry in an attempt to placate him, and took off speed walking down the street at top speed. He called after me several times, and then I heard his quick footsteps as he decided to follow me down the street. By then, I could feel my heartbeat in my eyeballs. My mouth had gone cotton dry, and I was almost hyperventilating with fear, trying to stay quiet so this asshole wouldn't hear me. I had this feeling that to show fear or look back at him would cause him to react violently right away. So I just put on a burst of speed and tried to outwalk him. However, my five foot five legs were no match for his crazy long stride, and I could hear little pieces of rock and concrete crunching under his feet as he closed in on me. I literally felt like my heart would leap out of my chest or explode from fear. 
I tried to walk even faster, but I could hear the guy right behind me. I could hear his breath in my ear, and I got this overwhelming feeling that he was going to grab me at any second, maybe with a weapon, and try to force me to walk wherever he wanted me to. The neighborhood is pitch black, and there is no real through traffic, not at night. If he wanted to force me to go with him, I'd be powerless, save for trying to run from him. But with his height advantage, I knew he'd catch me fast. Then I could finally see my boyfriend's driveway, and him standing at the end of it, waiting for me. He had a terrible feeling, and already worried constantly about me walking at night, so he'd come outside to wait for me. I saw that he had his crowbar in one hand, his usual defense weapon kept near the front door. And then my nerve broke, and I started sprinting towards him. And the tall dude behind me started to run after me. I reached the place where my boyfriend stood, and I squeaked out, Help! Or something like that. Dove behind him and cowered, waiting for the tall dude to pull out a gun and shoot us both, or start struggling with my boyfriend. It didn't happen. He gets right up in my boyfriend's face standing way too close to him, and asks for a light. My boyfriend gives him one, holding the crowbar aloft in the other hand, so that it was very visible. Then, I grabbed a hold of him and yanked him into the house, locking the door and absolutely losing it, sobbing and freaking out while trying to choke out what happened. My boyfriend goes looking from the windows and sees him kind of standing around, and then leaving. He saw him here and there for months afterwards, up at the store, or walking up and down the street. Unsurprisingly, I'm sure, I never took another nighttime walk. I still, sometimes, have nightmares about it. I've been wanting to post this for a while and haven't gotten around to it but it's the perfect situation for this sub. So I, 33 female, live at a funeral home owned and run by my dad. I live in the apartment upstairs and do some side work for my dad, but I don't work for the funeral home. Since I live there though, I tend to interact with a lot of people who are here for funeral related things and whatnot. I represent my dad when I'm speaking to someone here, so I'm always nice and helpful. Had a couple crazy people I've dealt with, but nothing like this. This was in mid-March sometime, because it was right at the beginning of the whole COVID takeover. I had gone to pick up some food for my family around 6pm. Unless there is a service, the employees are usually gone, and I believe it was a Saturday as well. So I pull into my parking lot, and as I park, a car drives by me, going towards the entrance side. It was a dark SUV, and there are so many people who work here who have similar cars that I couldn't see from that far who it was, but I gave a quick wave, thinking it was someone I knew. Bad idea. So the car stops and the guy gets out. Like I said, I'm used to having to help people and tell them where they can drop things or pick stuff up, etc. So this guy gets out and comes towards my car. I roll my window down a little, expecting to just say hello, and tell him that no one is here working. He comes right over to my window and starts leaning in and peering into my car, which was a red flag already. It was very invasive. I'm glad my doors were locked and I only put it down a little. So this dude basically had his head in my car and it creeped me out. But before anything else, his eyes scared the crap out of me. He was very, very pale, with bright red hair, and his eyes were literally the craziest and scariest eyes I've ever seen. It was chilling. I don't know if he was on drugs or just crazy, but I'm already uncomfortable at this point. So he starts to talk to me and ask me if I work here, blah blah. I tell him no one is working, please call tomorrow in the morning, and then you can speak to someone. Thought that would be it. Not even close. This man came to bring an application to my father to work for the funeral home. He was apparently in IT or something, but had studied in bombing and also volunteered for the Red Cross. He was talking a mile a minute, 
and I was so incredibly uncomfortable. But even more so when he started to tell me about how certain embalming techniques he studied included hanging cadavers by their feet and other insane, sick stuff. He had absolutely no experience in embalming, though. He cornered me in my car for 15 minutes and just rambled. I told him several times, please just call tomorrow morning. I really can't help you. So now I'm sitting here in my car with this insane man outside my car, and I also had food on my seat. He was looking into my car, so he saw it. You would think he would take it as a hint. At some point, I texted my husband and said, come outside now. Thank God he actually saw my text and came out. So he comes up to this guy and he was like, can I help you? So the guy starts cornering my husband also. This guy had absolutely no idea what personal space was and my husband kept backing up and he would move in closer every time. I took an opportunity to grab the food and get out since he was outside. When I got out, he started telling my husband and I, This virus is going around, and there are going to be bodies piling up. They are going to need extra help here when there are hundreds of bodies dead. It almost seemed like he was excited at the thought. He had a resume, and I told him multiple times to please bring it by again. I didn't even want to touch anything he had, but he forced it into my husband's hands. I went to the stairs and gave my husband a concerned look and motioned for him to come in. This guy made me so extremely nervous, and I didn't want my husband out there any longer, but this guy was almost impossible to walk away from. He did not understand that it was done. So eventually, we got away from this freak and got inside. I immediately called my dad to explain what happened and warn him of this guy. I told my dad I had never felt more uncomfortable in my life, and there was something seriously wrong with this dude. I wanted to warn him that he would probably be back the next day. Oh, he came back. A couple days later, mid-morning, I'm upstairs in my apartment, and there are several employees in the office upstairs. I hear someone ring the doorbell. Once. Twice. Three times. He then proceeded to ring it non-stop for 15 minutes. They assumed it was him and didn't answer. I went out and I was like, WTF was with the doorbell. They knew it was him apparently because he had called earlier and wanted to talk to my dad. And one of the employees told him that we aren't hiring, but he insisted on talking to my dad, so he came by. Then, after the doorbell went off for several minutes, the phone started ringing off the hook. Next, he was going around to all the windows and pounding on them relentlessly. I had told them how crazy he was, but I was glad they could now see what I meant and that I wasn't overreacting. Eventually, my older brother went down with a mask on. Like I said, this was right in the beginning and people weren't even wearing masks regularly, but this guy had no boundaries. He then cornered my brother the same way and would not let him leave and end the conversation. We were all thinking, WTF is wrong with this guy. My dad did not want to talk to him, but he wouldn't give up. Next day, he comes back again. Same thing, banging on the windows and ringing the bell, calling incessantly. Eventually, my dad's secretary answers the phone and puts him in his place and told him that if he called again, they would call the cops. The best part is, every time he showed up, he showed up in full top-to-bottom biker gear, spandex, helmet, knee pads, even though he apparently lived a few streets over. This guy was absolutely nuts. I'm so thankful he has not come back. Psycho-eyed biker dude. Let's not meet. Ever. Again. This happened back in the 80s, so very much the pre-cell phone era. I was in high school at the time. One night after dinner, my mom suggested we take a walk around the block to walk off dinner. 
My brother and dad were watching TV and opted to stay home, so it was just us girls. We lived out in the fringes of the suburbs, in a subdivision that was semi-rural. By that, I mean there were houses, but no streetlights or sidewalks. Everyone had septic tanks, as there was no sewer service, etc. The houses were all well back from the road, and the lots were wooded. Anyway, we're walking around the block, which is about 1.5 miles total, and we're almost back home. It's pitch black that night, no moon, and we had a flashlight to use as needed. Without it, you couldn't see much past a foot or two around you. We mainly used it as a signal if a car went by, but there wasn't really anyone around, so we had it switched off and were just walking and chatting. Just as we turned the corner onto our street, we suddenly heard footsteps behind us. This was a bit weird, as we had just come from that way and hadn't seen or heard anyone walking on that street or coming down the driveways we passed. But we figured it was some neighbor also out for a walk, and we hadn't noticed them in the dark. So I turned around to look and switched the flashlight on to see who it was. They immediately switched a flashlight on too, so I could only see their light and not them. They said nothing. We kept walking, but the footsteps behind us sped up now, and they sounded heavy, so we thought it was a man. We sped up. He sped up. I turned the flashlight back, and he turned his on again in silence. We were too scared to call out, and now we were approaching our driveway. As we got there, I pushed my mom in front, and I told her to get up the driveway, which was steep and long. Once she had a start, I sprinted up after her. As I did, the footsteps veered away to the other side of the road and kept going. Nothing was ever said by this person, and normally people here waved and spoke when out walking or even driving by. When we got up to the house, my dad said it was probably just a neighbor. So, my brother and I got in my car and drove down the road to see who it was. No one was there. We walked around all the roads, and no one was walking on them. There wasn't time for him to leave the area. Either it was a nasty neighbor getting off on scaring us and then ducking into a house, or whoever it was came out of the woods behind us and then disappeared back into them. I think I was in elementary school, or just starting middle school. We lived in a pretty normal neighborhood at the time, across the street from an elementary school. I have an older brother who's 13 years older than me. He was often out very late and would come home late because he would go out clubbing and whatnot, sometimes not coming home until the morning. It was past midnight one day, and I heard the bell ring multiple times, as well as knocking on the door. He didn't have a cell phone, it was the beeper era, so my brother couldn't have called anyway if he didn't have his keys. I got out of bed and ran downstairs, just assuming it was him. Before I could get to the door, I heard talking outside and a woman's voice. I looked through the window blinds and I saw an older woman staring right back at me. My mother then grabbed me from behind and told me to stay away from the window. Just then, the woman at the door began to pound on the door and start screaming. Help! Please help me! Help! Please! My mother took me upstairs and we sat on my bed, which was right by the window facing the front of the house, and she was holding me close. Thinking back now, I'm sure she felt terrified, but she didn't seem that way to me at the time. We had to listen to the doorbell and pounding of the door constantly for a few minutes before a man's voice behind the woman asked her, Where's my money? Which put an end to the knocking. My mother told me later that the man was standing behind the woman and there was a car parked in the front as well. The woman was maybe trying to stall and continued to bang on our door for a while before she gave up. They then left together very odd encounter that left us shaken for the night. Nothing bad ever happened at that house again, but my cousins have previously lived in that house and were once robbed when nobody was home. 
On another occasion, my aunt was in the kitchen by the back door, and a naked man was standing outside the door, staring in at her, through the window, smiling at her. After we left that house, the next residents were also robbed, so we dodged a bullet. I bet that man and woman that paid us a visit were working together, but I don't know what the whole line about the money was supposed to do. Were we supposed to feel bad for her and come outside to give her the money she needed? I'm glad I didn't open the door, and it gives me chills to think of what would have happened if I did. I'm a big fan of tea and cookies, and the convenience store near my house, a four to five minute walk, sells them. So, on the way back home from other stuff we were doing, I asked my mom to stop there so I could buy some. I'm a regular at this store, and by that, I mean I go there almost every day, since 2017, and I had never seen this man before. I just walk past him, but he stops me and points to the entrance to the store, asking if that's the entrance. I tell him yes and keep walking towards it, but he keeps walking beside me and says something in another language. I thought it was Romanian since I kind of recognized some of the words in that language. I'm a native speaker, but he told me he was Bulgarian. At this point, I'm already a bit creeped out by him because I'm generally scared of everyone. But in that moment, I just thought he needed help translating. We are in Italy, so I was trying to calm myself down. As soon as we enter the store, he grabs my arm and pulls me closer to him, and I'm just screaming inside of my head but I keep calm. I power walk inside and try to get rid of him, and when he asks me a question about bread, I just kind of try to understand what he says, since I'm still thinking he needs help. But at the same time, I'm scared. I just want to go back home. I try to lose him again through the aisles of the store, but he keeps following me, and I was scared of asking people to help me, because, like I said, I'm generally scared of everyone. He then grabs me again and starts touching my face, saying, Beautiful, very beautiful, young, in Italian. And then he tries to take my mask off, to take a better look. But I just start running for my life at that point. Get my cookies, go home. I told my mom about it, and she said I should have told her earlier so we could have confronted him. But honestly, I just wanted to go home. Tomorrow I'm bringing something to make me feel more secure with me, and I'll go back there to tell whoever works there to keep an eye out for this guy, since I don't want this to happen to anyone else. You may think some of the things I did were dumb, and I completely agree with you, but I was very scared, and I barely even look at strangers, so this was completely a new experience to me. Update. I went to the store again and told a cashier what happened to me, described the guy, and she was very understanding. Apparently, this isn't the first incident. Either there are two creeps that operate near this store, or this guy has harassed someone in the past. The cashier will talk with the manager about this, and I will from now on be careful when I go shopping there. She also told me what she thinks could have happened last night. She also saw a suspicious guy, around 45 to 50 years old around here. He was just kind of hiding in that thing where the carts are kept. I also saw him, but I just thought he was smoking or something. She told me that since I power walked towards the door, I came into view of a camera, so he followed me inside to see if I was just buying something and leaving fast, so he could finish what he wanted to start, and that the smoking guy was a friend of his. This theory scared the shit out of me. Either way, I want to make something clear. When he followed me inside, I was scared, but still logical. I knew what I had to do if he tried something more. He would have gotten reflex kicked in the balls, most definitely. So to preference this story, I was about 15 to 16 years old at the time. It was my best friend's birthday, and she had invited about six of us over to play a few games, such as Mario Party, Mario Kart, Guitar Hero, etc., and stay the night in celebration of her big 16. So at this get-together, there were five girls, including me, and one boy. 
After a while, my best friend asked if we would like to go to the playground, which was about a 10 minute walk away from her house. Of course, being stupid teens, we agreed, not thinking about how it may be dangerous since the majority of us were young girls and it was currently 10 p.m. Anyways, we walked down to this park and continued playing grounders when we arrived, which if you don't know, is a game commonly played in elementary schools. The rules are, one person is it. The person who is it must close their eyes and try to seek the other players as they hide on the playground equipment in order to tag them. But there's a catch. If someone gets off the equipment and the person who's it calls grounders while they're on the ground, they are then tagged. Yeah, I know, a pretty childish game, but it was fun. After a few rounds, we got bored and decided to huddle around in a circle in the center of the playground equipment. We were just talking, joking around, when suddenly I heard what I thought to be something like rocks hitting the chain link fence that resided on the back of the playground. I hushed the group. I looked over at my best friend, asking if she heard that, as everyone looked at me like I had 10 heads. She asked what I meant, and I told her it sounded like someone was throwing rocks at the fence behind us. She responded with a classical, Ooh, it's a murderer coming to get us. Naturally, I glared at her, flipping her off. She knows I get paranoid sometimes, but I have very good intuition, and something just felt off. A few minutes later, after some more rocks were thrown at the fence, and I obsessively stared down at the area behind the fence, which was all woods besides the houses on the left and right of the playground, in paranoia. I noticed a light weaving its way through the branches of trees. At first, I thought it may be just a headlight of a car that was coming down the street that connected to the street of the park, since you can vaguely see the headlights of oncoming traffic through them. But soon I realized that there was only one light, and it was bouncing up and down like it was being held by someone who was walking. I quickly pointed it out to the group around me as we all snapped our heads over in that direction. Coming up along the side of a nearby house, on the left side of the park, was a man who wore a hat, some baggy and dirty sweatpants, and a black coat. He was holding a flashlight, not the one on your phone, but an actual flashlight. He was too far away to guess his age, even when he sat on the swings closer to the playground equipment we were on. But we all collectively agreed that it was strange, since he seemed a guess from his clothes to be at least mid-twenties, and just came out of the woods by himself to sit and stare at a load of kids. After a brief discussion, we agreed that maybe he was waiting for a ride, or was just resting a moment, so we tried to brush the fact that he was sitting and so intensely staring at us off. However, we started to take note that after a few minutes of us resuming our very competitive game of grounders, that this stranger was slowly inching his way closer to our group. He went from sitting on the swing furthest away, to the next swing a bit closer to the equipment we were on, to the next, until he was just about 10 feet away from our game. The whole time, he just sat there, watching. At this point, all of us had noticed the strange man attempting to get closer to us, and in an attempt to remove ourselves from a potentially dangerous situation, we made a group decision to leave. Getting up, we all piled off the playground equipment, and in pairs of two, we walked down the stairs on the side furthest away from the creepy man. As we attempted to casually walk away, I kept my eyes glued on his figure, and as we reared to the end of the street, he got up. Slowly at first, the man started to trail behind us, keeping his distance. I decided to keep my mouth shut at the time, because we were about to make a turn. I thought if he continues to follow us instead of going the other way, I'd bring it up to the others. And wouldn't you know it, the creep stays hot on our heels, not only following which turn we took, but he also started sprinting towards us, screaming, You motherfuckers, I'll fucking kill you. At this point, the whole group bursts out into a sprint. The adrenaline I felt made me run so fast I was ahead of everyone else. Everyone was ushering each other to run. 
I didn't even take a second to see if the others were behind me. That was, until I heard my best friend struggling to run. She has pretty bad asthma. I instantly felt horrible for running off on her, so I ran back by her side, grabbing her hand and quite literally dragging her along, repeating things like, Deep breaths. You got this. Come on, we have to go now. This whole time, the man was still running and screaming behind us and was catching up quickly. At this point, both me and another girl in the group took it upon ourselves to get my best friend moving as fast as possible, both taking a hand and running at a pace she could keep. Luckily, this park was only about a 10-minute walk from my friend's house, if even that much, and as we all piled in through her garage door, I turned to see this delusional man start running up her driveway. He got about halfway until our big fluffy savior ran to open the door. My friend's hundred pound, fully grown German shepherd. She lurched at the man, barking as we gripped her collar in an attempt to keep her from running completely after the man. Luckily, her sudden and loud appearance caused the man to freeze in fear before running away down the dark lamp-lit street. We were terrified for the rest of the night and only managed to sleep after putting random items next to us. We even had a rake, but most comforting, our big fluffy hero, just in case the creep decided to come back. So the crazy creep who enjoys watching kids at the park and then chasing them home Let's not meet again. I have a lot of distance from the situation now, so I finally feel comfortable posting about it. When I lived in Boulder, Colorado, I was living in a motel-style off-campus apartment building. It was mostly students living there, and I was on the first floor. There was a large window right above my bed. There were many signs that the stalker was watching me for months before I fully realized the situation that I was in. It started with a few stolen packages here and there, a disposable camera stolen from my car, a random movie poster left in my car that absolutely none of my friends had ever seen before, and most notable, a man in a bright orange hoodie with his hood up walking back and forth past my living room window about 20 times one day. I was on the phone with my boyfriend when I noticed him at first, and I made a comment to him about it, but I figured I was overreacting. Two months after I noticed him for the first time, my boyfriend was out of town with his family on a trip, so I was watching his dog for him. I woke up earlier than normal to go walk her, around 6am. Afterwards, I laid in bed on my phone. At one point, around 6.30am, I look up from my phone and see the same man in the same bright orange hoodie, was standing over my bed, looking at me through the window. We were basically a foot apart, the wall and the window being the only thing in between us. I was frozen in shock, and he did not leave. He continued to stare at me for about 30 seconds, and then walked away. I immediately hid under my bed and called the police. I put two and two together, and I realized that all of these coincidences were not coincidences and he may have been coming by and watching me sleep every morning and possibly night for months. This was the first time I acknowledged him, and he seemed excited about it. The police told me to close all my blinds and to get a camera. Thanks for the help. They said this was common in Boulder, considering both the high school student and homeless population. The man didn't look homeless, though. He also didn't fit the description of anyone who lived in my building. The police officers had checked with my building manager, so that meant he was coming from somewhere else, specifically just to watch me sleep. I did as I was told and closed all my blinds. However, about two hours after the police officers left, he came back, banged on my window, and tried to open my door, which always automatically locked. I was absolutely terrified, called the police again and left town to go be with my boyfriend and his family for the next few days. When I got back, I never planned to stay at my apartment alone at night, but I figured I could unpack my things, as it had been a few days, and he probably noticed that I was gone. 
Within the hour of me being back, he was back. And this time, he held up a camera through the one crack in my blinds that I had and held up a knife behind the camera, slowly walking by and making sure I saw. I saw, all right. Called the cops for a third and final time. They made an official police report, and I moved out of my apartment within the week. I never saw him again, but from time to time, I did check my old apartment's reviews on Google because they tried to charge me 1800 to leave while knowing about the situation, which I thought was insane. Colorado laws protect stalking victims from these fees, though. Anyway, I checked recently, considering what the Idaho killer had been up to and how much it reminded me of my own situation. I saw a review about a man chasing girls around with a knife and the building doing nothing about it. It was from a parent, and I reached out to her personally on Facebook. The same man in the bright orange hoodie attacked her daughter in the parking lot at 4 a.m. with a knife. He tried to stab her as she was getting in her car, stabbed her car when he failed to do so, and tried to slash her tires as she started it, trying to escape. He's still out there, too. When I was younger, every year for Christmas, I would drive upstate to my aunt's house along a stretch of highway. I cannot for the life of me remember the name of this road. All I know is that it runs nearby Akron, New York, at some point. However, most of the drive is through rural areas, with little to no towns nearby. So it was the dead of night, and my groggy self had gotten off a long shift and had to drive my ass to my aunt's house since my extended family was expecting me the following morning. Near halfway through the drive, I realized I was low on gas, which irritated me. My brother told me he had filled it up the day before, so he either forgot or was straight lying. I saw an archaic-looking sign for a gas station off the next road. It wasn't an official road sign, literally a pole with a slab of metal attached with gas off next exit or something along those lines painted on. That seemed a little sketchy, but people do the same thing with fruit stands on highways, so whatever. I pulled off the next exit on some dilapidated country-ass road through dense woods. The whole thing was creepy and surreal. I kept expecting Leatherface to come running out of the trees with a chainsaw. Anyways, eventually, I came to the gas station and realized quickly it hadn't been open for years. It was all rusted, and the convenience store's roof was caving in. The gas pumps had all been taken out as well. I pulled over next to it and checked my gauge. I would probably only make it another half mile before running out. So I called AAA, and they said that they'd send a truck over. Now, I played the waiting game. I left my engine on, because when the headlights were off, everything was pitch black, and my paranoid self wasn't sitting next to an abandoned gas station in the middle of a forest, in complete darkness. So most of the wait went uneventful, until I sensed movement around the side of the old store, where my lights are pointed. I look up, but didn't see anything more, so I looked back down at my phone. Then, over the sounds of the night, I hear someone yell, Hey buddy, come here, in a demanding tone. I look up, and I shit you not, there's a dude standing by the old store, looking towards me, illuminated by my headlights. He looked like a run-of-the-mill homeless guy. I was honestly spooked, and I figure he must have been squatting there. Still watching him, I rolled down my window and yelled something like, Yeah, what's up? Still mentally crapping myself. I had my foot ready to floor it out of there at the first sign of trouble. You got any change? Nah, I don't. Sorry, man. I look up at him. He has this kind of vacant expression and is standing stiff. Then I see more movement. There are heads. About twenty or so heads peeking around the trees beyond the man I'm talking to. I can't see them clearly at all, but they're definitely people. Literally just heads staring in my direction from around the trees. 
I see another guy beginning to walk from around the gas station, and then I turn around and sped off. I got as far away from that place as my tank could carry me, and updated AAA on my location. The driver came back over and filled me up, and I didn't say anything. But after he left, I wanted to call the cops, so I called the nearest town's sheriff department. They said they'd send a trooper over, and I gave them the location. When I got to my aunt's house, they called me back and said whoever was there was gone. But they could tell a large number of people had been living there for a while. Blankets, canned food, the usual. The whole situation still freaks me out. But frankly, I can consider myself lucky. I'll always have such a creepy story to tell. I'm just glad nothing bad happened. Yeah, and to the creepy dudes at that gas station... Let's not meet. I remembered something that happened to my best friend and I a few years ago, and I figured I might share it here. While my best friend at the time and I were seniors in high school, 2016-ish, we went on a weekend trip to visit my grandmother, a couple hours away from my town in Georgia, USA. The town we lived in was comparatively small for the state, but one of the biggest towns within a few hours. But we had to travel about two and a half hours through tiny, somewhat redneck towns to get to my grandmother's place. We were on our way back home when we had to stop at a gas station literally in the middle of nowhere. I'm talking cornfields, cotton fields, streets with no signs or lights, not even stop signs, and definitely no cell service. The convenience store attached to the gas station had maybe a couple of snacks inside, but looked deserted from the outside. No other cars or people in sight, and we didn't bother to get anything other than gas. I paid with card mainly because I didn't want to leave my 5'1", 100-pound friend alone in the car while I went alone inside. Another car pulled up on the other side of the single gas pump while I just started pumping gas. And because of everything I'd read on this subreddit, I already had a weird feeling and decided to stay alert and stand outside of the car with my driver's side door open so my friend could see and hear everything going on. A thin, Late 50s-ish, older man gets out of the car and seemed to be paying at the pump and standing beside his car while he got gas. But after a few seconds, he walked around the pump and maneuvered himself around my car door to stand within a foot of me and asked if he could pump my gas for me. Luckily, the gas nozzle was locked, so it was pumping without me having to hold it and I immediately placed myself between the opening of the door and the man, and prepared to either shut the door with me inside, or move and slam it behind me to protect my friend if necessary. I calmly told him it was fine, no thank you. He looked me up and down with the corner of his lip tilted up, and said, Pretty girls like you shouldn't be out here all alone, and you definitely shouldn't have to do this by yourself. Let a man help you, baby. And covered my hand with his own. As he reached for the gas pump, I was holding. I jerked my hand out from underneath his and slammed my car door shut, thinking the last thing I would want is him jumping in my car and driving away with my friend in the passenger seat. Orange flags started tinting red, and my usual overly polite demeanor turned serious as I remembered something I'd read here that said it was better to be safe and to seem mean rather than be polite and uncomfortable. So I responded and said, Sir, get away from me. I can pump my own gas, and I've already said no thank you. Leave us alone. He didn't move, only raised his chin, and managed to make eye contact with me, all lip tilt gone. I stared him down and figured I'd gotten enough gas to last us enough time to get us the hell out of wherever we were. So I maintained eye contact, pulled the nozzle out, and basically threw it back onto the pump before getting into my car and drove away before he had even moved. 
As we drove away, I glanced in the rear view and saw that his car wasn't even being filled up with gas, telling me that he was driving by and decided to help a damsel in distress out. My friend was shaking the whole way home, telling me she would have just let the man pump her gas, but I'm just glad some of the confidence I'd gained from this sub helped me stay attentive and respond confidently enough to get out of the situation. So creepy, helpful gas station man in the middle of ghost town, Georgia? Let's not meet. I saw someone post a similar story on here, so I figured I'd share my own experience. It was March of 2019. I was 21 at the time. I'm also a male. I was getting gas at a gas station near my house, in a suburban area. A disheveled-looking woman came up to me, asking if I knew where the nearest CVS was. I told her it was just up the road, for about seven minutes, until you reach a major intersection on a business district, then you'll see it on the left. There was an uncomfortably long pause, until she asked me, Can we have a ride? While looking behind me, I turn around and there's a man standing on the other side of my truck, looking at us. I politely told her no and that I was heading in a different direction. Without saying anything, she nodded and they both left, walking away from the gas station. They had sketched me out and I also had a bag full of firearms and ammunition that I was taking to the gun range on the rear seats of my truck so I wasn't in a position to give two sketchy-looking people a ride. While thinking it was a strange encounter, I got in my truck and drove away. I thought nothing of it. Less than a month goes by, and my mom calls me to tell me that she's watching something on the news about how a man and a woman were approaching younger-looking women at a local stop-and-shop, asking for directions and a ride to the closest CVS. One of those people were so suspicious of the situation that they did what I should have done and called the non-emergency police number. I looked at the news report myself, and it was the same two people. It turned out these two had connections to a human trafficking ring. Their operation was apparently to get into someone's car and then force them to drive to a car they had parked at another location, then take the now kidnapped person to God knows where. Not really sure how that part was discovered, whether through police interrogation or just an assumption. All I can say is, be careful out there. Anyone can be picked up by traffickers, male or female, even in a relatively safe neighborhood. Don't just give anyone a ride. I can't find the news report or article from that day, but if I do, I'll post it in the comments. So, about two years ago, I, 16 female, at the time 14, was home with my mom. It was just us two. Now, my mom at the time was addicted to drugs and alcohol and was in an essentially drug-induced coma. Nothing could wake her up. I had decided to take a bath while she slept. My bathroom door was locked, as was my mother's bedroom door as she seemed to think we didn't know about her addictions and kept it locked so we didn't find out, and the house was silent. I had only been in the bath about a half an hour before I heard my front door open. I assumed it was my eldest sister coming back from work, as no one else would just walk in, but I wanted to be sure, so I texted her. Immediately, I got a worried text saying that, no, she wasn't home. Why? Was someone there? I froze. I could hear footsteps. Now, our house was small, one story, and from the front door to the bathroom door was only a small living room. I heard a weird scraping noise coming up the hallway to the bathroom. I heard the scraping stop outside of the bathroom door, and then someone grabbed the doorknob and kept turning it very slowly, side to side, 
for about a minute. The entire time, I was silent, frozen still, and shaking like a leaf. I wanted to call my mom and ask if it was her, but I didn't want whoever it was to hear the sound and get to my mom. After a while, I didn't hear anything. I stayed in the bath for what I think was an hour until I heard the front door open and click shut softly. I still stayed in the bath long after the water had gone cold until I heard my sister come in and yell if I was here and if I was okay and why was the door unlocked. I got out of the bath and heard her gasp before I had come out. But when I did, I swear my blood went cold. There was a line spanning the wall of the hallway where the paint had been cut, like someone had trailed something sharp along the wall. Currently, the theory is that the scraping noise I heard was someone trailing a knife on the wall. This is something that happened to my family and I in 2007 or so. I was 10 years old then. My parents' house is quite big. It has two floors and is situated in a residential neighborhood just outside of a big city. It's an upper class, very chill, and incredibly boring neighborhood, but pretty safe. We weren't upper class though, just that my parents were crazy enough to start building a house with their own hands without hiring professionals because we couldn't afford it, basically. Also, sorry if I sound weird. English isn't my first language. Okay, back to the story. One night before going to bed, my dad went to check if the front door was locked, but he must have been very tired that night because instead of locking it, he unlocked it. At that time, my grandma was living with us and her bedroom was the one on the ground floor. My sister and I, as well as my parents, had our bedrooms upstairs. As you walk through the front door, you step into the hallway which leads to my grandma's bedroom on the left, and also the kitchen next to it. If you make a right, you walk into the living room where you can go up the stairs onto the other floors. To get into the living room, you have to take a big step downward, like you'd go down the stairs but there is only one step. I hope you guys can understand what I'm talking about. Sorry, I'm trying. In the middle of the night, my grandma hears a loud bang. She gets out of her bedroom and looks around to see what happened. No one else heard this. At first, she couldn't see much because the only source of light was the moonlight shining through the windows. The light switch was all the way across the living room, right next to the staircase, so she had to walk through the living room to turn the lights on. For some reason, she didn't turn the lights on and decided to walk up to the couch that was in our living room because she could see there was someone laying on it, but she couldn't figure out who it was. The lights were off. She thought my mom must have had an argument with dad and she came downstairs to sleep on the couch. It wasn't my mom. It was a stranger. The loud bang she heard was this person falling off that step that led into the living room. You wouldn't expect it to be there if you just think it's flat ground, so they fell pretty bad. It just didn't cross her mind that it could be someone who broke into our home, who breaks into someone's house and decides to sleep on the couch. It's so random. So, my grandma goes up to the person, touches them gently, and asks what's going on. Why is she sleeping there and not in her room, thinking she was talking to her daughter, my mom? The intruder is a woman around her 50s. She mumbles some random words, and Grandma realizes immediately that the woman trying to sleep on the couch wasn't my mom. She also reeked of alcohol. At that point, she goes upstairs to my parents' bedroom and tells them that there's a stranger sleeping on the couch in the living room. My parents freak out, and my dad proceeds to take his sword off the wall. Yeah, he had a sword he used to take good care of like it was his baby, and he kept it hung on one of the walls upstairs. My mom was hanging on to my dad from behind as he slowly walked downstairs with the sword in his hands. He tapped the woman with the sword while she was still laying there. She was drunk out of her mind, shouting at her and asking what she was doing in our house. She was barefoot, and it was winter at that time, so she walked in the snow without any shoes. 
At this point, my dad realizes that it's just a homeless person seeking shelter as it was very cold outside and she wasn't properly dressed for it. She was scared and was begging my dad not to hurt her. They eventually called the police and they took her with them. I don't know what happened to her after that, if she was arrested or not, but we never saw her again. My sister and I slept through all this mess, which is a bit concerning and her parents told us what happened the next morning. It was a bit unnerving, thinking that if my grandma wouldn't have heard that loud bang, who knows what this woman would have done while we were all sleeping. This happened a couple of months ago, and I'm finally feeling safe alone again. It was around 1.30 p.m. when my dog started barking for me to take him outside. I put on his leash and walked outside my first floor apartment, leaving the door unlocked behind me like I had done a million times before. Seriously, I never thought twice about it as I live in a really safe neighborhood in an extremely safe, almost boring town. In my 27 years of living here, nothing had ever tested that sense of security before. My dog is 15, so he moves a little slow and really loves taking his time sniffing around. He'll usually stop and pee three different times, and that day was no different. But suddenly, a big white truck filled with lawn equipment slowed down in front of me. Make sure you pick up after your dog. I looked up and saw a man in his late 40s or so wearing polarized sunglasses and a bandana around his lower mouth, neck, um, he just peed. I responded with a little bit of attitude, like, thanks, I got this, now drive away. I looked up again, and he gave me a wink, and lowered his bandana to blow me a kiss before he drove off. He instantly made me feel uncomfortable, but as a young Hispanic female, I had been used to older Hispanic men being inappropriate and making me feel like that for years. It's just a sad reality, so once again, I thought nothing of it. I was walking back to my apartment when a woman came out of her apartment in the next building over and stood on her patio, motioning for me to come to her. Now, I've never met this lady. I had seen her around the complex, and she seemed nice enough, but ultimately, I didn't know this woman. I've watched Dateline. I'm not going up on her patio. I asked her what she wanted, and she just insisted I go over there so she could tell me. I told her I needed to bring my dog back inside, but maybe I could help her from outside where I was if she told me. Next thing I know, this woman is freaking running towards me. I pick up my dog, ready to run home myself, and then she stopped, probably five feet away from me. Please, listen to me. A man walked into your apartment while you were walking your dog. I think he was one of the mowers. I was sitting in my car when I saw him walk in, and I know you live there alone. I called 911. They're on their way. I could feel my face burning as I tried to process what I just heard. I watched the man I had talked to drive away. I didn't see his truck anywhere. How could that be possible? What I didn't realize was that while I was talking to him, he had positioned his truck right in the line of sight of my apartment. I couldn't see my door, so I was distracted and looking away, while another man walked in. If my neighbor hadn't happened to be sitting in her car on the phone, I would have walked into my apartment, completely unaware that someone would be inside waiting to do God knows what. I'm so thankful she was so observant, even prior to the incident, because she knew there shouldn't be anyone else in that apartment and had a gut feeling something was wrong. The police arrived not even five minutes later and arrested the guy. He said that he had my permission to use the restroom, which was obviously not true. Since my door was unlocked and we can't prove for sure what his intentions were when he entered, he was only charged with trespassing. That's a misdemeanor in my state and he did no jail time, which obviously freaked me out because this guy knew where I lived. The man driving the truck technically did nothing wrong, but it's so scary to think that they might have been working together. I stayed with my parents until we were able to find a legal loophole to get out of my lease and move me out of that apartment. 
I moved into a house with an old friend and got a ring system installed that same day. My dog has a backyard now, my dad mows the lawn for us, and I still get coffee with the neighbor who called the cops for me. The creepy landscaper who walked into my apartment while I was walking my dog? Let's not meet. It finally started raining here, so I took my son, 14 male, out mushroom hunting over the weekend. It was later than we normally go, and sun goes down much earlier, but we were taking a quick trail to the river and back in hopes to find turkey tails or chanterelles. We took a wrong turn and ended up going through a big field, which the trail would take us back around to the main trail to the river. As we walked towards the main trail, the last group of people had left, and it was just me and my son. We walked along, and out of a thicket side trail came this weird man. He had a dog with him that was alert at his side. He was staring at us as we walked closer towards him. Then he started waving at us, this really weird, slow wave. I was immediately uncomfortable and goosebumpy, but I didn't want to be impolite, so I half-hearted waved back while staring back and telling my son to slow up a little. I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After a few minutes of us dawdling, the guy slowly turned and began walking down the trail towards the main trail. I was wary walking. I didn't want to go too fast, and we stopped to look at some plants, so the guy and dog got further down this trail, which curved to the right and continued on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking, if this was a creepy let's not meet, this dude will be waiting around the corner. And, sure enough, he was standing at the junction, off to the left and towards the parking lot, and to the right was a .6 trail to the river. Dude was just standing there with his dog, staring at us, not moving at all. Both my son and I were like, holy shit, WTF, let's keep wide to the right. And saying he looks old, we could run faster than him, and just generally planning for freaky deaky, just in case. He kept staring at us, so as we approached, I asked if he was okay, and kept staring back. He was greasy-haired tiny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, plaid long shorts, about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix. He didn't answer me at all, just kept staring. We turned to the right and walked about a block. I had my phone cam facing me so I could watch him over my shoulder, and the only movement was him slowly shifting his direction to continue staring at us. I didn't say anything else to him. It was moderately unsettling, his stare, made more so by his lack of response, a motionless face, weird tiny glasses, and slow wave at us like a zombie. He did leave because on our way back, he was no longer standing on the main trail. So hey, freaky deaky forest zombie dude, for sure, stay in the thickets and let's not meet. My family and I went on a trip to the Hawking Hills area of Southern Ohio a few weeks ago. There was a place that I've always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town Moonville Rail Tunnel. I've never been to this area, so I didn't know what to expect, but I did know it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin using Google for GPS to the location. We started driving, and it's, for lack of better words, really impoverished where we are driving. Hills have eyes-esque. We literally only see a few cars on the way there and are on back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter into a forest and we are close to the tunnel. There was a sign that said we were entering Bubba Wood. For little additional information, I drive a Mercedes that I am just lucky to have and have my husband in the car, a black man with dreadlocks my 10-year-old nonverbal autistic son, and my 6-year-old daughter. We drive down this really creepy stone road into the forest, and there is nothing back there. No houses, no cars, nobody. 
We see signs that we're close and pull in the parking lot. We walk over the footbridge and make our way towards the tunnel, which is a lot larger than I expected. We hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck comes driving through the tunnel towards us while we are on foot. He gets out of his truck with a chainsaw and it's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere we go and through the tunnel. I tried to make small talk with him and pull some info about if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources, etc. He really wasn't budging. We turn around to walk out of the tunnel and he starts using a chainsaw behind us and the sound is just echoing through this tunnel. At this point, we have no cell phone service and literally no one knows my family is out there except us. I was already worried my car was sending the wrong idea to people, like we have money or something. We don't. We rush to the car to get the kids in their booster seats and this MF comes driving over the footbridge in his truck towards us in the parking lot. I honestly don't even know how his truck fit on it. He stops again and gets out of his truck and starts walking the other direction, much to our relief. About this time, I notice there are dusty handprints on my car. I asked my husband if they were his, and we compared his hand and my son's, and they were not a match. I don't know who could have touched the car because we were with the chainsaw man the entire time we were there. We get out of there as fast as possible. Just a few minutes later, I look in my rearview mirror and there is a bunch of dust kicked up behind us and there he is. He had to have driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch up to us like that. There is nowhere to go in these woods. The road is basically one lane and we have no cell service or GPS. Every time I think we lose him, he is there again. I am waiting for my tires to get popped or something or for this guy to ram me off the road into a ravine in the woods. Finally, we get out of the woods, and I turn around, and he's still following. We were following printed directions to get back, and I ended up making a wrong turn in the excitement. The guy in the truck was finally gone, and I turned around to go back past the stone road that goes into the forest. There is one lone house near this road, and there is his truck parked there. He had to have seen us drive onto this road into the woods and taken some back way to the tunnel. I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington, near Mount Rainer. Like, not an official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night, I wake up and hear something, open my tent, and there is a guy sitting by where my fire had been, right outside of my tent. Nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude, just sitting there a couple feet from my tent. No bag or pack or anything with him, just a guy. He saw me open the tent. His eyes got huge, like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly, but over the next day, I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well after writing it off as just some odd occurrence, and a guy that was probably high or something, and had somehow managed to set up a camp, coincidentally not far from mine. Then, two days after that, and 10 to 15 miles away, in totally random directions that nobody could take the same path as on accident, I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises that I got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them, and out of the darkness, someone was like, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said no, I don't even think that's a real place there. They kept talking from just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, but they yelled, Aim that away. And kind of spooked and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person, I did. After like 15 minutes of me being very freaked out, 
and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer. So I shined my light that way again, and it was the same dude who had been outside my tent two nights before. He had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days, because there is no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot as vast as that wilderness is. No possible way. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. I started to chase him, but I didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark, so stopped quickly after probably only 100 to 200 feet. This one couldn't be written off because the only way he could have been in both places is specifically if he was following me. I decided the trip was very over first thing in the morning and hiked back out over three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anyone following off my trail and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me. I really can't describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid, potentially, being murdered. On the first night of hiking out, twice, I heard what sounded like a person walking circles outside my tent, but by the time I mustered the courage to look, nobody was there. On the second night, I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first in the distance, but slowly decided it sounded more like a human making animal calls, but could have actually been an animal, but I didn't actually see the guy again, but it really sounded like a person making howling noises. I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day, probably the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were, and no way of getting an explanation, but I really can't articulate just what a terrifying few days it was. This happened some time ago, in the early 2000s. It's not made up. I really experienced these events, even if they sound crazy. My parents were in a rough patch, and my dad had moved out of the house. I was in high school at the time. It started out one night my mom and I were watching TV. It sounded like scratching noises, heavy dragging noises in the attic, and we immediately assumed raccoons. I don't remember the timeline exactly, but we kept hearing this noise, and each time, maybe a few nights later or a week later, the noise slowly crossed from one end of the attic all the way to the other end of the house. My mom did have a company come check for animals, but they didn't find any. Then the real scary stuff started happening. I was asleep one night, and I woke up to a figure next to my bed. My best description is a shadow person. I slowly grabbed my blanket and covered myself up with just a peephole to watch it. It was entirely black, even darker than the dark room around it, and it looked like the darkness was slowly steaming off of it. I was both amazed and terrified. I watched it for what felt like hours until it slowly backed out of my room. I was afraid to leave my bed. Eventually, I fell asleep. The next morning at breakfast, my mom said that she saw someone standing at the foot of her bed, and then I told her what I had seen. There was a heaviness in the house after that. Other times, I remember waking up at night and hearing voices and whispering. Sometimes I could hear music playing, like it was an old theater or something. When I peeked outside my room, the noises would cease. One night, the dresser drawer at the foot of my bed slammed open and shut. Another night, my mom started screaming in the middle of the night, and I grabbed my baseball bat and ran into her room. Just outside of her bedroom door was a chair, and I swear I saw this shadow figure sitting in it as I ran into her room. She told me someone had laid down on the bed next to her. As the events and encounters progressively got more frightening, we were afraid to stay in the house at night. I would sleep with all of the lights on, if I could sleep at all. We started spending the night in a hotel. Even in the daytime, you would hear things like someone calling your name. 
I can't remember how long the haunting lasted. I'm guessing at least three to four months had passed, and my mother was tired of being afraid in her own house, so she had the house blessed. Sometime in the next few days, my mom was heating up a cup of water for tea in the microwave, and it exploded in the microwave. I asked her how long she had put it in the microwave. Then boom, these loud scratching sounds ran down the walls. Around us, a dark mist filled the house, the voices and whispers all around us. My mother and I grabbed each other's arms in horror. All of these sounds were happening simultaneously. And then this very deep, unnatural voice began talking over all the other noise. It was deep and unnatural. And if it was some sort of language, I've never heard anything like it, not even to this day. As my mother and I stood there, we looked down the hall towards the voice. Something was there, like a fucking horror movie. It was a quadrupedal made of darkness, like a drawing with Sharpie in the air. It had what looked like several rows of spines down its back. And then my mother started to pray, and so did I. The creature slowly backed down the hall and into a bedroom, and slowly, all the noises and voices faded away. The mist and the haze seemed to follow it down the hallway until everything returned to normal. Never saw or experienced anything again in that house. If anyone was curious, yes, when friends came over, they would have experiences as well. I've had other experiences since, but nothing like back then. Sorry for the length, I'm sure I've left out some bits, but thanks for reading. This is my experience with something paranormal. I was adopted into my current family about five years ago, that being February of 2017. My family had a nice house, where my siblings and I all had our own room. There was also a basement, which at the time was a game room for all of us, and was the biggest room in the house. Eventually, my two older brothers moved out during the second year of me living there. When they did, my sister and I decided to switch rooms. I got her room, and she got the basement room. During those two-ish years, my sister complained about numerous nightmares and claimed to have seen dark shadows at night, as well as hearing the boiler room and storage room door open. Me and my parents would just laugh at the claims and would say that it's because of how late she would stay up and all those energy drinks she had. I wish I hadn't laughed. This past December of 2021, my sister moved out due to her graduating early, and my parents renovated the basement room, where I then moved into. I was excited about having my own space downstairs. It's about the size of a smaller studio apartment, with enough closet space and a bathroom with a walk-in shower. On my first night in the basement, it was so messy due to moving everything downstairs, so I stayed up past midnight organizing everything just wanting to get it done. I heard the basement door open. I thought it was my mom, so I naturally joked around and said, isn't it past your bedtime? I called out. I opened the bedroom door and looked up the stairs to see the door just wide open. I was kind of confused, but just shook it off and closed it. I went back downstairs and closed the bedroom door. I eventually finished and went to bed. In the morning, I asked my mom if she went down there during the night, and she denied it. She claimed it was just me being tired, so I shook it off. I didn't experience anything for a few days. I came home from school one evening. I was home alone, and I came home to all of the bedroom doors open, as well as the door to the basement. We have cats that weren't allowed downstairs, so I worried that they may have gotten into things. My mom never forgets to close the door because of that, so I immediately thought that someone may have broken in. But our front and back doors were all locked still, and I had come in through the garage. I ran down to check, and I saw our cat in the boiler room. She was in the far corner. I heard her hiss at something. I swear on my biological parents that the boiler room door swung closed. It's hard to shut due to the wood door frame being somewhat uneven. That's what confused me. 
me trying to be brave. I went into the corner, grabbed my cat, and I opened the door. I shut the remaining doors and went back upstairs, where I found my mom just coming home. What are you doing with the cat? She asked me. Did you leave a bunch of doors open? I asked her. No, I'd been gone since 8am and I haven't needed to go down there. Why? I told her about what happened and she mentioned how maybe my brother stopped by and pulled a prank on me, but neither of us could explain the door swinging closed. That night, I couldn't fall asleep. I began to get all paranoid and I started to overthink the situation from earlier. Then it hit me. I remember the things my sister complained about when she lived in the basement. The next morning, I brought it up to my mom, and she looked somewhat concerned. She never believed in the paranormal stuff, but I did. I'm pretty sure this convinced her. After this, it kept happening. The boiler room door would be open mostly, but from time to time, my bedroom door and storage room door would be open. Lights going crazy on and off happened a few times as well. I had my one and only incident of sleep paralysis, where I thought I saw a tall shadow in my bathroom doorway. I decided to ask for help. My friend's mom was a medium, and I asked her if she could come to look and step into the basement to see. She agreed and came over one night. It was back in April. She said she was drawn into the boiler room immediately. She claimed that the energy was dark in this boiler room specifically, and that there was some type of spirit, and perhaps an entity that was trying to find peace, and was just angry. She suggested we get the house blessed by a professional. My mom and I appreciated the help, and she left. My parents knew the house's history, and they were all confused. To this day, now late May of 2022, these events still occur despite having the house blessed two times, but the activity has slowed down. I honestly believe that my sister's collectible antiques may have gotten attached to the house, but I'm not sure. She had a few creepy clown dolls and old frames for aesthetic purposes back in high school, but then again, those items aren't in our house anymore. I'll take any tips if you have them. Thanks for reading. Before I moved to London, I used to live in a 1950s built house in Hampshire, UK. My parents had purchased it in 99 from an old couple who had lived in it since it was built, so no one had died in it. The first strange thing that happened was the cats wouldn't stay in the house. They would always bolt out for some reason. After my parents started renovating, my brother and I started to feel like we were being watched in the house. And at night, in the living room, you would always feel like someone was watching you through the new glass doors from the hallway or the stairs. After a while, if we were sitting downstairs, we started to hear footsteps moving from my bedroom in the room above, walking to my brother's neighboring room, then across the landing to the hallway to my parents' room. My parents both dismissed it as the pipes cooling or the floorboard settling but you could distinctly tell what boards the footsteps were treading on. At one point, friends came over. I was alone, and as you walked down the street, you could see into our living room. They asked if I had relatives staying, as they had seen people sitting on the sofa. Things started to move. You'd place shoes by the door, and they'd be under the stairs, or things like keys would be moved somewhere else. Then, it gets really creepy. One day, I had run a bath and was listening to music on the computer in the study in the next room. It had been a while and the music had stopped as the PC had gone into standby mode. I had been in the bath about an hour and fell asleep, and as the water had just gone past my nose, the music on the PC shot back on louder and woke me up. Bearing in mind, in those days, you had to mash the keyboard or really jiggle the mouse to wake up the computer, saving me from potentially drowning. I took this to be whatever was in the house wasn't bad. However, a few weeks later, I woke up, bolt upright, like something had woken me up. Must have been around 2am. 
My door was open on the landing, and it was a bright full moon night, shining through the hallway onto the brick landing. I looked, and to my terror, I saw an old man, but he wasn't standing up. It was like he was laying down on the stairs, and his head was at foot height, staring around the landing wall, directly at me. The moonlight was on his face. It haunts me to this day. I closed the door and slept with my light on for the rest of the night. My parents sold the house in 2004 when they moved to New Zealand, and when I spoke to my dad about it later, he said that he knew something was in the house, but hadn't wanted to scare my brother and I. He'd had his own experiences. He'd heard the same footsteps on the floorboards and in the mornings when he'd get up and make tea for mum. He'd hear footsteps behind him in the kitchen, walking towards him, something brushing past him, and the taps would turn on by themselves. Years later, when I told him about the old man I'd seen, he said on a few occasions he'd been in the lounge at night, and in the reflection of his reading glasses, he could see the exact same man sitting in the armchair behind him. My dad is a massive skeptic, a policeman back in the day, and a no-nonsense project director. Apparently, he was so freaked out, he went to the public records office to see what our house had been built on. The area had been made up of old mansion estates back in the Victorian times, and it looked like our kitchen had been built over a pathway leading from the old big house to an ice house outbuilding. He thinks maybe it was the servants or whoever walked that path. Very spooky. I'm a 22-year-old female. At the time of this incident, I was about 16 or 17 years old. Because of what happened, I now never walk anywhere by myself, after dark. I had decided to sneak out to meet up with a friend, but neither of us had a car, so we were going to walk and meet up halfway between our houses. The halfway point was about a 40-minute walk. We ended up meeting up at around midnight, and the walk there went fine, no issues. We hung out for a while and ended up losing track of time. It was now about 3 a.m. I had to get home before my parents woke up for work or risk getting caught. We said our goodbyes and I started my long walk back home. Since it was 3 in the morning, it was basically a ghost town, not a person in sight. I hadn't seen even a single car drive past, so I figured I would have a nice walk home. I was wrong. About 10 minutes into my walk, I hear a car coming up behind me. Nothing too alarming about that. As the car passed me by, they slammed on their brakes, then cut off all their lights. Immediate red flag. I saw the car turn down the next street ahead. I knew I would have to pass them to get home. Instead, I ran into a nearby parking lot, hid in the bushes, and pulled out my phone to call my sister to, at the very least, let someone know where I was at and what was happening, and call 911 if needed. I unlock my phone, and of course, 1%. Fuck. Then my phone died. As soon as this happened, I started to panic. I waited there for what seemed like forever, and decided to start towards home again. I start walking again and past the streets they turned on, and didn't see any cars, I started to relax until I walked a little bit further and saw the very same car parked in the Burger King parking lot. As soon as they saw me, they started to back out of the parking lot and head towards me. I bolted across to the other side of the street. Instead of staying on the same road, I ducked into a neighborhood that would let me go back to the main road, but closer to my house. I got back onto the main road and thought I was in the clear. Then. Sure enough, the creep was driving towards me, and as soon as he passed me, he made a U-turn, so that way he could follow me again, driving slow enough to be directly behind me. Luckily, another car was coming up behind him, so he was forced to speed up. I saw him up ahead, going to turn around again. I took this opportunity to lay down in the grass between someone's fence and the sidewalk, just out of sight so any passing cars could not see me. After he passed again, I got up, 
and started sprinting towards a neighborhood that would lead out to another main road that my house is off of. I made it to the main road, and it was so close to my house. But again, I see the fucking car. He passed me and started turning around. I ran across the street and through this field, and hopped my neighbor's fence, cut across my court, and ran inside. I had never been so happy to be home. This guy followed me for my entire walk home. I'm not sure what would have happened if I just kept walking and ignored all the warning signs, but I know his intentions were not good. It was by far the scariest thing to ever happen to me. Creep that followed me for 40 fucking minutes. Let's never meet. So this was two to three years ago in India, and my father and I were driving home from a wedding. I don't know how much y'all know about weddings over there, but this was a three-day event that involved the entirety of two middle-of-nowhere-nothing villages. It was a huge deal, and we were the only white people the majority of these folks had ever seen. So beyond the bride and groom themselves, we were the best guests. This meant near constant attention no relaxation or any time to ourselves, and sleep came in the form of a concrete slab of a bed with a thin blanket over it, nestled snugly in between apparently every drunk uncle the village could hold, all passionately arguing for hours about something in Hindi. I think it was maybe the music, which also constantly blared from concert-sized speakers through the whole village. It was safe to say by the time we left the wedding, we were already extremely sleep deprived and out of it. This isn't even the fun part though. Through an odd chain of events that isn't totally related to this story, while driving home on the single lane road that had traffic in both directions, dodging donkey carts, groups of scooters, and other drivers at about 120 kph, 72 miles per hour for us freedom uniters out there, we get in a head-on collision. I remember realizing what was going to happen a few seconds before it did, closing my eyes, loosening my body, making sure my tongue would be okay, and then, bam, the world turned upside down, and then again, and again, and one more time. Our car flipped four times, landing upside down in an overgrown field near the spot of the accident. The other car was mostly gone, and what was left of it was still on the road. Glass was everywhere. My dad was unconscious. My lehenga was ripped to shreds, and there were suddenly voices all around me. I remember being extremely confused and dazed, and I hurt. Why did I hurt? Dozens of people had apparently stopped to flip the car back over to help the American tourists out. A few people pulled me out through the left-hand broken window and immediately went back in to help my father on the driver's side. I, extremely confused, exhausted, and scared, most likely concussed, I later found out definitely concussed, wandered over to the road and the other demolished car. I could hear a siren in the distance. An ambulance? Cops? I didn't pay attention. Where were my shoes? Suddenly, a man had his arms around my shoulders and was ushering me to an unknown white car, a small distance from the wreck. I will take you to the hospital, he said. I asked where my father was and a few other questions. He mostly ignored me. He is fine. Come on. He pushed me forward and in a daze, I followed, asking about my things, my shoes, my dad. All I had was my phone which was still in a death grip in my hand. He ignored me. Don't worry, hurry, get in the car. I did as I was told, though I remember asking a few more times about my shoes. I was barefoot and limping. I remember being focused on my right foot, how it wouldn't work, basically ignoring the guy guiding me away from the accident and the rest of the people. Why did it hurt so much? And where was my bag? The man urged me forward some more, making promises that my things were fine. He had them already, just get in the car. I was barely paying attention, slowly following. 
Where was my dad? At that point, I guess the man decided I wasn't moving fast enough. He wrenched my phone from my hand, maneuvered me into the back seat, and slammed the door behind me. He was walking around to the driver's side when an ambulance pulled up. I struggled with the door, saying I'll get into the ambulance instead, that my dad must be there. And where were my things? No. He slammed the door again, locking it this time. Be quiet. At this point, I started crying and was still confusedly trying to open the locked door, blubbering that I needed my things. He insisted he was helping and to shut up, shut up, shut up. He rushed around, opened the driver's side door, and was about to get in when I heard an almost roar-like sound erupt to my left. Suddenly, my father was there, bleeding, limping, ignoring the chaos all around us, and angrier than I've ever seen him. Get my fucking daughter out of your fucking car! He grabbed the man, who was halfway in the vehicle at that point, and threw him to the ground, unlocked the backseat door, and rushed around to pull me out. Dad, where are my shoes? Does he still have my phone? I obliviously asked into thin air, as my father was already back a few feet away, shouting, hands around the man's throat, demanding my phone. With a terrified look, the man pulled it out of his pocket and threw it several feet away, causing my dad to drop him on the pavement in one swift motion and bound after the device. At that point, the man hurriedly climbed into his car and sped away while I made my way to the back of the waiting ambulance, still not really processing what just happened. My dad materialized on the bench next to me a few seconds later, my cracked phone in his hand, and enveloped me in a huge hug while saying how scared he was, the paramedics moving all around us, securing everything and preparing for the drive to the hospital. Everything after that is a story for another time, but to the random Indian man who most likely tried to abduct me from the accident, let's not meet again. Before I begin, this encounter happened about 10 years ago. I was 22 years old, and I'm well aware that this was a very poor judgment call on my part. My parents always taught me to help someone in need, just not necessarily to the extent that I allowed. Up until this point, I didn't have much of a reason not to trust people may not have good intentions. I've also had an unreasonably difficult time saying no to people my whole life, and have since had the help of a therapist to be better about that. I've only told this story to a handful of people because I truly am ashamed of my actions and potentially putting my daughter's life in danger. I was on my way to an event of some kind with my three-year-old daughter when I realized that I had left something behind in my apartment. I was close enough to home that I decided to turn around and head home. As I was pulling into the parking lot of my apartment complex, a woman was walking kind of in the middle of a driving area and began waving me down. I pulled up next to the woman and rolled down my window about a third of the way. She gave me the story of how she works at the nearby nursing home and she had run out of gas on her way to the gas station and was asking for directions to the gas station. I didn't think much of the fact that she was roaming around my apartment complex because it was pretty common for people to cut through it as it sat between two main roads and avoids traffic lights. I gave her directions for a five minute walk to the gas station, but she mentioned that she was pregnant and she wasn't feeling well. I tried telling her I was in a hurry and assured her it was a very quick walk, but she begged. At this time, she noticed my daughter was in the back seat. She had a look of surprise that I didn't think much of at the time, and she began talking to my daughter and made her laugh. She turned back to me and asked one last time if I could just drive her to the gas station. At this point, I just gave in. I let her in my car, and she almost immediately asks if I have any money she can use. My heart sank at that point realizing she was probably lying and just wanted to lie her way into some cash. I was honest with her and I told her I was broke 
and I also didn't carry cash on me. She pointed out another resident in the complex and asked me to drive her to them. In my mind, there was still a slight possibility she needed gas, but didn't have the funds for it. So, I drove her to the other person, and she rolled down my window, asking for money. They said no, and she pointed out another person. At this point, I told her I really had to be somewhere and couldn't keep helping her. I drove her closer to the other person, but far enough that she would have to get out of my car to walk to them, which thankfully she did. When she got out of my car, I sped off and drove to my destination. I told my mother about this story, and a week later, she sent me a clip from the local news. The news mentioned a woman who would approach people asking for a single favor, which led her to asking them for money. If these people said no, she pulled out a syringe or a needle of some kind and would threaten to stab them with it and did end up stabbing them on one occasion. I look at the image of the person and instantly recognize that this is the woman that was in my car. I know these types of people don't have much of a conscience, but I truly believe the fact that my daughter was in the car that day is what kept that woman from stabbing me. When I was a third year in college, I was one of the RAs in this house on campus. My school is on an island off the coast of Maine, and most of the buildings, except for the new dorms, are converted New England mansions and cottages, some built in the 1800s. The house I was in is a converted mansion, complete with the servants' quarters and nursery. I was a senior RA, so I got the old master bedroom, which was at the far end of the house, next to a fire escape. Prior to classes starting, the RAs go through a training week. It was actually two weeks, and everyone stays in this house since it's the biggest, and then move to their respective houses at the end of training. The other RAs all stayed in the servants' quarters. More fun, I guess. So other than feeling a little lonely on my side of the house, I was content to unpack throughout the week on my own. Things started about three days into training, when I started finding colorful craft feathers inside my stuff. As in, I'd open a seal box and there would be a craft feather there. Or I'd take out a pair of pants from a drawer and underneath, I'd find a feather. They were always tucked away, except one that was in the middle of my floor. It was odd, but I chalked it up to mice in the house and disregarded it. Then one night, early on, I was awakened to footsteps in the hall. My immediate thought was that something was wrong and another RA was coming to get me. There was no other reason someone would be down here at this time. I took note of the time, 2 a.m. on the dot. I could hear the footsteps come up to the door and then nothing. I was a little spooked, but I figured I'd ask about it in the morning. Next morning, none of the RAs admitted to walking down my hall at that hour, so I let it go. Until, that night, it happened again. The footsteps woke me up, and again, it was 2 a.m. on the dot. Then it happened the following night. I started to get freaked out until someone suggested it could be a night watchman. Because this school is a total hippie college, we didn't have proper security on campus but we did have two old Mainers who did nightly rounds. They would walk through the dorms, public spaces, and check that the alarms were working and no one needed anything, etc. Great guys, knew them by name, and they were always friendly. Of course, it had to be them. The timed footsteps, the fact that my room was beside the fire escape. They probably went down those stairs, and I just couldn't hear them. I decided I would meet the night watchman at 2 a.m. so I could put this behind me. I set my alarm for 1.55 a.m. and propped my door open, turned on all my lights, sat on my bed, and waited for the night watchman to come my way. At 2 a.m., I hear footsteps approaching. They're getting closer until it sounds like they are right at my door, but there's no one there. I get up and I go to my door and look down the hallway. Nobody is there. Because I'm petrified and need a rational explanation, I call out, is anybody there? Immediately, everything I had on my door, 
my name tag, RA papers, the little door signs on my doorknob, everything falls off at once. Terrified, I slam and lock my door and keep the lights on all night. In the morning, I tell my fellow RAs, and they are all laughing at me, thinking I have an overactive imagination. I suspected maybe they were pranking me, but then things escalated. Fast forward to orientation week. My house is all freshmen, so I know their schedules, which is pretty much in mandatory orientation sessions in the lecture hall. I decided I needed a nap before lunch, and I went to my room and slept from 12 to 12.30. I would catch the end of lunch before they stopped serving at 1 p.m. I am completely alone in the house. I wake up with my alarm at 12.30 and I head out to lunch. I decide to cross all the way through the servants' quarters because their fire escape and external door dumps out to the main path. To get to the servants' quarters, I have to pass through the other main rooms, and then there is a sort of threshold that has a large bathroom between the house sections. As I pass by, the door handle is turning back and forth, like someone is stuck inside. Despite my weird experiences, my first thought is that someone is legitimately stuck in the bathroom. It happened to a few RAs during training, the door is warped and doesn't fit the frame perfectly. I knock on the door and say, Hey, this door sticks. Let me help you. But they ignore me and keep turning the knob and rattling the door. I knock and repeat my offer to help, but they continue. Then the door flies open and then slams in my face. Then it opens again and slams in my face. Then it opens slowly and stays open. Because I'm dumb, or just duty-bound, I feel like I need to check and make sure I don't have a resident stuck in there or something. I step inside the bathroom. There is no one in there. I run out of the house and into the dining hall and find my co-RA, who lives in the servants' quarters of the house, and I tell her what happened. She just tells me there's a logical explanation. The window was probably open and caused a pressure difference. I'm so scared, and I tell her no way that is what happened. That night, to the amusement of my residents, I walk through the house and say out loud, If there is a spirit in here, I don't want you to feel like you can't live here, but we have to coexist peacefully. I am terrified of you, and I don't want to be. We can both live here. Just please, don't show yourself to me at night, and please let me sleep when I go to sleep. I feel like I needed to make boundaries, but I also didn't think I could ask it to leave. Things smoothed over. Sometimes I would get the feeling that something was in my room when I'd be studying, like a friend sitting down on my bed or something. When I was ready for bed, I'd announce it, and it would feel like the presence would leave, but it could totally just be my brain making things up. Fast forward to Halloween. I've come down with pneumonia and am very, very sick. I spend a day in the hospital and then was sent back to campus with meds. A couple days pass. My co-RA comes to check on me one night and asks me how I'm doing. I tell her I'm getting there, but my room is a disaster. Clothes and papers everywhere. I start to get up, saying I'd feel better if I could just put the papers in one pile and the clothes in another. She tells me she'll help me do this tomorrow, but now I should sleep. I fall asleep, but am awakened by noises in my room. I also had a mouse problem, so I was careful to never leave food in my room. I realize maybe I forgot to bring a mug or something downstairs, so I turn on my headlamp to look for the source of the noise and deal with the plate or whatever. As I'm shining my headlamp, I see one of my sweaters slide across the floor then a folder in the opposite direction, then more clothes and papers. Everything was sorting itself, just like I wanted. I was terrified, so I say out loud, I'm so grateful that you're trying to help me, but I'm so sick and I need to sleep. Please stop. And then everything stopped. I fell asleep. In the morning, my co-RA tells me I must have been feverish and did it myself. I guess it's possible, but I know what I saw, and I no longer had a fever at this point.
The following year, I asked the head of the buildings and grounds, who was here since the college opened, whether anyone died in that house. He told me before this was a college, the owners of the house had a three-year-old boy who died on the premises. I'd love to believe it was his spirit just looking for a friend. I hope he's moved on now, but I have a sort of fondness for those spooky experiences. Nothing has happened to me since, so I really think there was something about that place. It's been 11 years since I lived there. So my whole life, I'd had minor experiences with the paranormal. Things like hearing people say my name, or footsteps when I'm alone in a house, or at work. However, I have had two bigger experiences, and this is the scary one. When I, 40 female, was 20, my parents rented a house and let me take over the basement. My parents' room, along with my sister's room and an office, were on the second floor with the living room. We had no issues when we first moved in, or for the first few months, which I truly believe was because a friend of mine was staying with me in the basement. After she was kicked out of her house, she stayed with us only until she was able to get her own place. However, as soon as she left, I began waking up about 2 a.m. every night and seeing a dark shadow across the room. At first, I thought maybe it was my eyes playing tricks on me and just tried to ignore it. Around this time though, I began to get a bad feeling down there and started spending more time upstairs when just hanging out at home. I was working at a pub and so I would often be home during the day alone while my parents were at work and my sister was in school. It was at this time I started hearing footsteps walk up and down the hallway on the second floor, which I later found out my mom would hear if she was home alone as well. But whatever was upstairs felt peaceful. Now, this is where it gets a little scary. I started to realize that the dark figure I would see at night was getting closer. I didn't notice right away because it would just stand there, but each night, it was about one step closer than the night before. Now, looking back, I probably should have moved into the office upstairs when it got to my bed, but I didn't. The last night I stayed in the basement, I woke up to this black shadow on top of me. I felt as though I could not breathe, and I started to panic while at the same time, I could not move at all. It was terrifying. I felt like it lasted forever and yet it was most likely only a few minutes. I took my blanket and pillow, ran up the stairs, and slept on the couch in the living room. The next morning, when my mother woke up and saw me sleeping on the couch, she asked me why. When I told her what happened, she looked pale, like all the blood drained from her face. Then she told me that at the same time, she and my dad, who is very much a non-believer, had a very similar experience, only strangely not as scary, more like a warning. We only used the basement for storage after that. To this day, we think whatever was upstairs was trying to warn my parents of what was happening to me downstairs. Howdy, board. As with many, I've always been into the paranormal, but never really believed in any of it. I've sought out ways of experiencing paranormal things, but any time I've had something, I've had a way of dismissing it and could chalk it up to just a weird occurrence. About a year ago though, I switched roles in the museum I work at. I've been here for five years and some weird things have happened, but again, you can rule out most to weird coincidences. But when I moved to the collections department, where the people who take care of the objects and artifacts in the museum's possession and on loans, things got weird, really weird, really fast. Everyone talks about museums being haunted, and it's understandable. We house and care for lots of really old, sometimes creepy, objects, and many of them have storied pasts. Our collection is roughly 200,000 pieces, and we have some doozies. 
To make it short, I've been seeing shadows, hearing my name, and have lights turn on and off when I'm alone. Our storage is split into three areas. The upstairs mezzanine is home to our toy and puppet collections. Downstairs has three connected areas split into two rooms. Textiles by itself, and American materials, and ethnographic world objects in the main area. And the third area is in a separate part of the museum split into two and houses larger objects and natural sciences. The most convincing evidence I've experienced for the existence of paranormal activity happened about a month ago and has really stuck with me. To set the scene, I was in our textiles room, lower level storage, in a room off of the main area with the world objects, returning some clothing we had shown on a tour. To briefly explain the storage setup, you come down the stairs and can go left into the world objects or right and take a turn into the American materials. However, the stairs are the only thing separating the areas, so the stairwell is more like a dugout hole than anything. Turning left into world objects and immediately taking another left will let you walk perpendicular to the aisles of world objects and bring you to the right side of American materials. On that right wall, looking out into American materials, is the door into textiles. It's normal practice, like with most places, to only have lights on in an area you're working. So, I had the lights on at the base of the stairwell, the very front of world objects, and that illuminated enough of my path into the textiles room. Up until now, I had had lights turn off, doors slam, heard my name, and had objects move. Basic things, but stuff I could ignore, look past, or explain away. I went down the stairs into this area and was immediately overcome with panic and anxiety. The room was cold and there was just a bad energy. I turned around, sat in my office for a couple of minutes, thinking I was just having a panic attack and cooling off, and decided to just ignore it. I went back down, hit the lights, beelined it into the textiles room, and started putting things back in place. I felt like I was being watched the entire time I walked through the lower level, but didn't think about it and figured I was just paranoid, but I couldn't shake this gut feeling of paranoia. Then I left the room, and that's when it got bad. I opened the door, and I can see all the way across American materials. The last shelving unit on the far wall from me is where we keep items from a famously deceased child. The family donated all of their belongings after their passing. There weren't any lights on in that area, but I could see someone. It looked like a fully grown man, probably around six feet tall, and the shape was hulking. But they were darker than dark. They were darker than the shadows of the room. I'm telling you guys, with my oath on whatever you want, that I could see this person that was darker than an unlit wall, and it sprinted. I mean, absolutely ran as fast as I've ever seen anyone run into the closet wall. Not at me, not to scare me, but sprinted to its right, which was only about 10 feet away from it, into a cement wall. This all took place in about 5 seconds, and I just ignored it. I just quick walked out of the storage, flipped the lights, and halted up the stairs. I got about halfway up the stairs when the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up and I heard someone say my name, and the doorknob at the base of the stairs started to turn. I didn't even stop to listen. I'm sure there's a way of explaining it. Again, I very much could have been having a panic attack but the anxiety went away just about as soon as I walked back up the stairs the first time. Since then, things have gotten stranger, with objects moving in front of me and other people in the department, or doors closing in front of us. Like I said, things have happened since I've been here, and there are plenty of stories of before I was in the department or at the museum, but this thing a month ago was just different. I'm only writing this now because last night, I had a dream where a ghost or something was holding my mouth closed and pushing on my back, and when I woke up, it was happening too. I feel like things are getting weirder and weirder with me, and I've been looking into shadow people or other sorts of weird apparitions. 
I doubt this gets much traction, but if anyone wants to chip in on ideas as to what this might be, or how to explain it, I'd love to hear any and all thoughts. Wishing my best to all of you.